Yeah, actually my second fight with Noguera. It's one of my most teachable moments. You know, here I get rocked. I'm almost out. Herb Dean, I think, is about, you know, about a heartbeat away from stopping the fight. And then I get slapped into a guillotine. And not only do I turn it around, but I break his arm in about nine different places. Noguera just, like, looks at his arm. Yeah, Noguera's a tough guy, man. He's a crazy tough dude. <laughs> what is happening to fame? Another episode of Chat and Pony with yours truly, Paddy the Baddy. Uh, just thought I'd let you know. If you just want to listen to an audio version of this, it's on Spotify and Apple Music. So give it a little like, five stars, comment, it helps us. And if you don't know already, get over to the Apex website for your latest Baddy merch. But today we have an MMA legend, a former UFC champion. But Frank, I want to ask you myself if I'm saying your name right. Fra is it Frank Mia? Because that's how I've pronounced it for years. Uh, so, yeah, no, perfect pronunciation. It's Mir. Yeah, brilliant. But uh, as I always say at the start of my podcast, I like me guests to uh, tell everyone a bit about themselves, to introduce themselves a bit. As I've just said, in my eyes, you're an MMA legend, former UFC champion, but tell everyone a bit about yourself. Uh, I've been uh, doing martial arts my whole life. My dad owned a gym, so it's kind of a way of life I grew up. I started training uh, before I could remember, and then um, you know went into MMA not so much to become a, a rock star or to make money, because at the time in the late 90s and early 2000s, there really was no money in MMA. I did it just to prove to myself as a testing ground, you know, just to kind of put myself into adversity and see what I was made out of. And to this day, that's still why I like to compete. I just want to see what I'm made out of. So I can go back to the gym and work on things. A lot of guys, I think, uh, they don't make their life hard enough. And, you know, and I live a very comfortable life, especially now. So I always try to find opportunities to make myself uncomfortable, uh, to see who I am. And so uh, that's pretty much my religion. It's my faith. It's, it's what I believe in is martial arts as a way of life. Uh, my children are the same. My daughter now is a state champion, uh, national champion on top of a multiple time state champion wrestler. She has a scholarship to Iowa. She's wrestling in the best college you could possibly wrestle at in the US. Uh, my son's a state champion wrestler too as a freshman in high school and he's already on a, a nationally ranked football team as a linebacker. Uh, he's gonna write his own ticket. My youngest right now is still establishing who he is, but I'm trying to push him into jujitsu more. They all trained it, but uh, I don't have anybody who's gonna win any jujitsu tournaments between the two older ones. I'm like, hey, <laughs> can somebody at least <laughs> choke somebody out a few times for me? <laughs> Great, well, I don't wanna have to touch on it because it's something that I've read recently that you wanna have your retirement fight on the same card as your daughter. Like, I think that's amazing. Yeah, I just, uh, pretty much a passing of the torch. You know, my daughter is the future of MMA and I'm uh, the twilight years into the past. Uh, so that transition of uh, just us both being on the same card, I think, is a situation that, you know, it's very hard to, uh, that, you know, how many guys out there are world champion uh, martial artists and UFC champs and record uh, Hall of Fame holders, and then they go on and their daughter becomes the next one, you know, uh, and pushes on and, and even exceeds their, uh, you know, their uh, records and, and what I've established. So having us on the same card uh, for the fight promotion that I'm a, a part of, uh, I think would be phenomenal, you know, really be able to make sure it's done properly. Yeah, obviously, I was looking at your record and your fourth. I had your debut in 2001. I was six years old. And, like, women, <laughs> women's MMA wasn't even a thing then. So, back then, no. looking forward to now, the change in the sport is just phenomenal, isn't it? Yeah, I really enjoy it. You know, my daughter first was interested in martial arts. You know, I told her, like, look, you're going to train this because everybody in the household has to be a martial artist. Is a, is is a way of life. It's kind of like, you know, you can go to church on Sunday. It doesn't mean I want you to be a preacher, though. You know, I don't want you to make a living out of this. But this is going to be how you conduct yourself, how you form your spirit, your mind, and your body. And, uh, you know, then Bella, like, fell in love with it. She wanted to be a fighter. She didn't understand why the boys got to fight, and she couldn't. And, you know, and that conversation was already hard enough. My daughter actually played on the Gorman freshman football team and started. Um, she's the only female that was a non-kicker to do so. So Bella's already been an unusual individual growing up. And here her brothers get to play football, and she had to quit football her freshman year. I didn't let her play beyond that. Just because I started trying to explain to her there was this thing called biology. And because she's a female, she's not going to get much bigger. And, and all those males are going to have this influx of testosterone. And you might be kicking their ass now, but um, that's going to change really quickly. And I don't need you getting hurt. And so... Uh, then Ronda Rousey happened, and that changed my argument to where I was like, well, well, shit, the second highest paid athlete ever to do MMA is a woman. You know, so as a father, I want my children to do something they love, 
first and foremost. You know, I, I think people put too much weight into having money. And uh, I see a lot of miserable people around me that have more money than I do, and they're, they hate life. Uh, but I see people that do things that they love, and they really enjoy life. You know what I mean? Can it be a little bit of a struggle if you don't have the financial means? Yeah, but... Life's always a struggle, right? But as long as you're doing something you love, I think it makes it worth it. So then Bella hears something she loves and she's going to do it. And she can be have more money than I'll ever make at it. And so that's when I, I finally uh, stopped trying to negotiate her out of it and decided that, you know, the expression I constantly use is the ship was going to sail. I was either going to be on the dock waving at it or I could be on the top of the mast uh, captaining this thing. So uh, I just thought to be the captain. So that's where we we're going with Bella's career. She's already had three fights all in Mexico because she wasn't old enough. She's kind of like herself for her three fights at 17. She went 3-0. and And then uh, uh, we had one, actually, take that back. Her first two fights were Mexico. Finally, she was 18. We could fight in the States. We fought for uh, a good friend of mine, Dale Cook, is uh, the XFN. And now we look like she'll do her next fight. It depends on how wrestling's going. I'd like her to fight in March for FFN, for me and Harrison and uh, Sophia. But uh, if that doesn't work out, definitely we're going to fight together. We're eyeballing June 23rd right now. Uh, June 24th, I think, uh, that Friday, um, to possibly be uh, my final uh, MMA fight and her, uh, you know, really another uh, debuting for her to showcase who she is. Yeah, it'd be a breakout performance for her on the same card as you. And as you say, that'll be some feeling. Like, that'd be ridiculous, going to be able to fight on the car same card as your daughter. It's given me goosebumps, to be honest. Well, we all corner each other now, too, even my son. We, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're my cornermen, you know, and I'm Bella's cornerman and same with Cage. We, we've really made fighting a family affair right now, you know, and it's great that I can, you know, in between, it's, it's weird to walk back in between corners and I sit there and I tell Bella, like, all right, so what do you see? You know, and she's like, ah, he's putting too much weight on his lead leg. I'd keep going there. Do you see a setup coming? No, I don't. Okay, neither do I. All right, good. And so it's weird as going in between fights now in, in, in the corner that not only am I still a fighter and I'm listening to her, but I'm putting her in a position to think and, and, and really adapt her brain to be, uh, to make this her second home. Yeah, who would have thought that years ago that people would have like the family members in the corner? Everyone thought that MMA would just be a flash in the pan and it'd be gone. But as you say, you were there in the dark ages as I was six years of age. So what like, what was it like fighting back then when basically there was like hardly any rules? You weren't getting paid next to nothing. Yeah, well, it made it hard to tell people on a date. Like I remember when I first met their mother, you know, and uh, you know, I was a bouncer at the Rhino for over a decade. And, uh, you know, she came in on a, a, a bachelorette party, a co-ed thing, you know, so they're all partying and hanging out, you know, and then I started hitting on her and stuff. And then the conversation gets awkward when it's like, oh, so like, you know, what do you do? You know, and I'm like, oh, well, I fight, you know, like, oh, so you box. No, not exactly. I do this thing called mixed martial arts. I think at the time I even might have used the word NHB, you know, no holes barred fighting, you know. And, um, you know, at the time, she thought I was doing, like, some kind of Billy Blanks kickboxing, like, aerobic <laughs> stuff, you know. So uh, I had my fight coming up with Pete Williams. And uh, I told her, you know, hey, because she didn't live in town. I was like, you know, why don't you come into town? I'll get you a ticket. You know, we can, you know, go to my fight. I won't really see you beforehand, but afterwards we can go out on a date and we can talk and stuff. So she comes to the fights having no idea why all these people are showing up to watch uh, kickboxing or, or to watch, like, some kind of aerobic demonstration. So uh, she watches the first, I think I was like the second or third fight of the night. And, you know, so she's watching me walk out and I take his arm off in about, you know, 45 seconds. And so uh, I walk back to the locker room and I'm really excited because, all right, the girl that I like, that I have the hots for, just watched me just dismantle a man. It's very primal. It's very much on my cave, you know what I mean? Beat my chest on the alpha, right? I go to the back and uh, I check my phone and she broke up with me. <laughs> She goes, you know, uh, I already have a son, you know, uh, you know, that I raised, and I don't know if this would be a healthy environment for me to have him in. You're, I didn't realize you were so violent and, and, and just like a basically like, you know, a, a brutal beast. I was like, and, and hindsight, I don't know how I actually pulled this off. I actually called her back because she was trying to leave. Like, no, no, no you have to stay. I'm, I'm talking to you. This is not how this is going to end. So I kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> very aggressively, <laughs> which probably was not good in my argument, told her, no, you're going to hang out for a second here. What I have to say about this. And so when I came out to her, I said, no, you know. This isn't that I'm a violent person. We're all violent creatures, you know, just like we're all creatures that like to eat. We're all creatures that like to pro uh, procreate. You know, we all have these urges inside of us, but I'm someone who's trying to master these urges and be a person who can control them. And this is my venue for doing so. I'm not a person of violence, but I can control violence. And, you know, I don't avoid it because avoiding violence isn't a man that you're ever going to want to have. I'm a person who will see violence as an opportunity to control it and, and subdue it and control it within myself and control it in others. And she gave me a second date. And then, uh, you know, the rest is uh, history. We have three children. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they're all also very much in part of violence. 
That's brilliant, as you say. I couldn't imagine with the missus turning up to a show thinking that she's coming to see some sort of crazy aerobics and then she just sees people's arms getting snapped and people getting elbowed in the face, especially in like, what year was that? Like 2002, two, three? That was 2001. Man. 2001. And then basically in a nutshell, yeah, like I didn't go around telling girls, you know, there was a couple guys that walk around with tap out shirts, but for the most part, it wasn't socially acceptable to say, hey, I'm a fighter. Nowhere near like it is nowadays. I mean, shit, nowadays, people that aren't even close to ever being a fighter, they could train with one and they tell all their, you know, they tell people <laughs> they that they're a fighter. You know, now it's kind of, you know, it's the sexy thing that I'm a fighter, you know? Uh, it's cool, you know, and back when I was fighting at the very beginning, it wasn't cool. It definitely wasn't a way, you never met a girl's father and be like, hey, I'm going to date your daughter. And I also plan on being a, a professional uh, martial artist. I'm going to go fight in the MMA and, you know, take my shirt off in front of thousands of people and go beat up another man. You know? uh, wasn't really a, a hard line sale. So at the, at the time, didn't you become the youngest ever UFC champion? Yeah, I was the youngest heavyweight champ of all time. Uh, still, I think the youngest heavyweight. Yeah. At the time, I was the youngest champion until John came along and broke that record. Yeah. I've gone on after last year, obviously. What, what, what's it feel like winning a UFC world title? Like, it's obviously what I aspire to do, so. I think I overbuilt it in my mind. It was actually very depressing. Um, I think sometimes when you really strive your whole life to achieve certain things and then when you get there, you build it up that somehow it's going to be this change, you know, there's a, that, uh, that it's going to be something more than what it is. That like, ah, now that I've accomplished this, it satisfied something inside my soul. And it didn't. Um, very much it was like, wow, all right, well, now what? Uh, you know, obviously defend the title and, and keep moving forward and become a better martial artist. And as long as I kept my mind in those areas, I had to rethink how I thought of the title. I had to realize it was just, just another fight. It really didn't, you know, it was a, a great establishment as far as, you know, it's kind of like getting an A on a test, right? But at the end of the day, there's a test afterwards and there's a the next test. There is no, all right, well, now I'm done. I'm going to put this up on the mantle and, uh, you know, and talk to the grandchildren about it. You know, that on this day I did this and, and that's it. It was just one step of many steps in life's journey. And so, uh, yeah, when it first happened, I was a little bit on the depressed side. It took me a little while to bounce back from it. Didn't, you didn't end up defending it immediately, though, did you? Didn't you end up having your accident straight after that? Yeah, so um, when my wife and I first got married, because of my schedule, as such as you know, right, it was hard to plan a wedding, you know, because I didn't know if I was going to get a last-minute phone call, or, and I was fighting about three times a year. So we got married at the Little Chapel of the West here in Las Vegas, and it wasn't a special wedding. I mean, obviously, like, you know, I think I wore jeans, you know what I mean? And a button <laughs> shirt, and, you know, she wore a nice dress. You know, her grandmother was there. My, you know, I think my mom was there. And it was probably less than 15 people. And then, uh, so my wife afterwards, like, hey, you know, no little girl dreams this is going to be their wedding. I get it that we're doing this, so we're legally, you know, we're together and married. But, uh, you know, I want the wedding, you know. So I was like, all right. So the following year, we had planned this big wedding. We put all these deposits down on it. I mean, there was like the doves coming out of a box, you know, under an oak tree in Sacramento. And it was uh, this, you know, I think it was like a $45,000 wedding, something ludicrous. Another life lesson that my children will never make. <laughs> um, and so uh, 10 days before that fight, I had bought a motorcycle as a victory present to myself. I like bikes. I like adrenaline. Obviously, I like to, you know, I like to go fast. So uh, I had bought a motorcycle, and 10 days before the wedding, I guy ran a light. Honestly, I deserved probably to wreck that bike many times over, and that was one of the moments that I actually was being good. Uh, I had no gas, so I flipped over my gas tank to reserve. I had my form on the tank, and I was just cruising to the gas station, and, and probably why I wasn't on high alert, and, and because I wasn't pushing the envelope, and because I was in a relaxed state, and, uh, and the guy ran a light, broke my leg in half, threw me about 90 feet through the air, uh, I didn't lose consciousness, which I wish I would have. Uh, that would have made things a little bit easier. Oh. Vomited inside my helmet and, uh, you know, ended up in the hospital with uh, getting a rod shoved through my leg. I tore a bunch of tendons in my knee, dislocated my hip. Uh, almost tore my toes off my foot, even though I was wearing leather boots. It ripped my boot off. and uh, They put my toes back together, but it's still not the same. My feet are numb on my left side. And sometimes that's why it's funny. People make fun of me because I always wear flip-flops. And, uh, and I had to, you know, it's kind of a morbid conversation. Be like, hey, man, shoes hurt. You know, if I wear flip-flops, we're more comfortable. And, yeah, I'm a jiu-jitsu guy, so it makes sense. Uh, so, uh, yep, 10 days before the, my, our official wedding, I'm being, you know, wheeled out of the, into a, a surgery room. And so uh, we went through it, though. I, I, it was probably one of the most painful experiences of my life that we um, drove from Vegas to Sacramento, which is about a nine-hour drive. I just uh, I took a bunch of pain pills and a bottle of vodka and sat in the back of the truck. 
my wife drove and every bump I felt, it was ungodly. And then when we went to the wedding itself, I didn't want to ruin her pictures. So like I looked very pale in our wedding pictures, which is kind of funny, but that's because um, uh, I couldn't walk, but I had crutches. So I had my brother and my cousin get me to the front of the line. And then I stood there on one leg as much as I could and threw my crutches to the side and went through the ceremony, which still was probably only about a minute and a half. And it was like, it was an ungodly 90 seconds. And I'd be like, oh, you're crying. I'm like, yeah, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to sit down. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, which also led into another issue that, I, that from that was that, uh, you know, for many, many years and still to this day, you know, I struggle with pain pills uh, because of that accident that had a very, uh, you know, it had a life altering effect on me. I was going to ask you as well about the, the mental aspect of that, obviously, because I know what it's like for me when I can't train and I can't get in the gym because of an injury. Mm -hmm. It affects me mental health in a big way. And as you say, you got addicted to painkillers and stuff like that. Obviously, do you think the mental side of it played a big part in that? Yeah, it was hard because I didn't realize I do have an ego about myself. I'm a humble person, but at the same time, there's a part of me that knows if you lock me in a room with another man, there might be only 10 to 20 guys in the world that they're going to walk out before I do. Um, uh, I walk around with that. I walk into a bar. If someone wants to stare at me, I'll stare back. What are you going to do? I'm going to take you while your girl watches. You know what I mean? Like there's that part of me that very much exists. All of a sudden that went away here. I'm, you know, walking with a cane. My leg is screwed up. You know, I can barely hold my balance. And you know, now when I'm in situations, um, I was much more aware that I was mortal. That, uh, that like, wow, you know, if this three guys decide to kick my ass, there's not a lot I can do to stop them. You know, man, I'm out with my wife. You know, I very much take that one of the assets or one of the, uh, you know, attributes a man must possess is that we have to be protectors, you know? And I didn't feel like I could protect my family. Uh, I got really, you know, infatuated with carrying guns and knives around probably at that point in my life to make up for the fact that I couldn't fight, you know, that, that if I got into a fight with somebody, I'd be in trouble. And uh, it took many years for that to come back and many years for me to get over that, you know, and then it really, it, it was funny because you don't know how, what you have until you lose it was definitely something I lived by. I was like, wow, I never realized, it's kind of like being a good looking guy and you tell everybody, ah, oh, looks don't matter. I'm like, of course they don't matter to you. You're a good looking guy, you know, or, you know, money doesn't matter coming from a rich person. It's like, all right, let's take it away from you and see how much it matters now. So when I used to tell people like, hey man, chill out, be calm, because I would never fight people, because I'm like, ah, I, you know, this is stupid, you know. But that's because I felt very confident in my ability to go ahead and, you know, crush someone's skull. You took that away from me, I became actually, there was a period of my time there in my life, I became extremely violent, uh, because I was insecure about myself. Uh, you know, I was that dog now that immediately bit out of fear, not because I had the confidence to, uh, to, to of, of knowing what I could do, because I didn't have it anymore. And so um, it really took me full circle on the understanding of martial arts. And actually, I look at it as a blessing to this day. Um, really, if my mind would not be what it is today, and I can give those to my children, I can convey that to people that listen to me. I can't really give people athletic ability. I can't give them the fact that I'm 6'3", 260, you know what I mean? It's like, well, you know, uh, break someone's arm. It's like, well, I'm a little stronger than the average person, you know what I mean? From day one, I could lift weights better than anybody else could. I could jump higher than almost everybody in the gym. It's like, well... How do you give that to somebody else? You can't. You know, how do you give, you know, John teaching somebody to have an 84 inch reach? You can't do that. Uh, but I can teach you how to come through adversity. You know, and that's one skill set that I really developed how to deal with fear, how to overcome, you know, just daily life. And, um, and that car accident made me face that and made me conquer it. And, and now I have a skill set that I'm actually able to give to other people and my children included. How, like, how did you get back in the gym there? Because obviously you say, like, your leg was snapped, you had know, so many other injuries. Like, how did you even get back in the gym and start training? You know what I mean? My wife. <laughs> smart woman. So I would go to the gym and, like, you know, it was just horrible. You know, I'd go out there and guys, I couldn't keep someone from passing my guard. You know, one leg kick and I fell flat on my face. I couldn't spar, couldn't wrestle, couldn't change levels. And so, you know, it was miserable. I'm out there getting embarrassed by guys that don't even do this for a living. They go to work and they're a blue belt, you know? So I, I didn't want to go. And so my wife uh, talked to Joe Silva, who was very much of a mentor of mine growing up. Um, you know, what do we do? She and him put their heads together and like, all right. My wife knew my personality that just give him a, a, a date. Let's just book him a fight. And Joe's like, is he ready? And she's like, no, not even close. <laughs> She's like, he'll probably, let's hope he doesn't get killed. You know what I mean? Like, hopefully he lives through the situation. But she's all, no, he's not ready. But, but I know my husband, if we give him a date, he will try to show up. You know, it's like, he will figure it out. 
And sure enough, she did. They put a date on the board and said, hey, Frank, you're fighting in you know, eight weeks. You got I think it was paid upon him. And you know, at that point, I got out of breath getting out of bed, you know? And so I, I went to the gym. I probably trained successfully out of six days in the week, one on average. The rest were either I didn't show up or I just was in too much pain to do anything. And, you know, practice would start, my leg would buckle, and then I would just sit in the corner and, you know, woe is me and cry to myself. But I showed up anyways to the fight, and then uh, I got to feel it again, a little bit like what it was like to be back in there. And even though it came out as a loss, um, it helped wake up things inside me that was like, screw this. This is not how I want to have my life. I don't want this to be the final chapter of, of my existence. So uh, it, it inspired me to come back and figure out a way to win. Uh, you know, and I tell people that, you know, like, my second Noguera fight is a great embodiment of what I try to teach people. If you watch the fight, uh, right off the bat, you know, I was way overconfident in my boxing ability because of the first fight. I boxed the shit out of him. And, you know, boxing's boxing. And you get caught. Now, I got caught with a shot and was hurt. At that moment, we had talked about his best submission being the guillotine. We didn't think that at his age or his injuries that his triangle was any good anymore. Some of his other submissions he was known for we thought was kind of probably you know, not at the peak, but his guillotine, because of, you know, he's a full grown man and men only get stronger until they're, they get old, um, was still vicious, you know, he had choked out, you know, uh, you know, Tim Sylvia with it. And I think he choked out Randy with it. So we were talking about, hey, his guillotine, let's not drop our head and get stuck in there. Probably best to avoid that area. So here in the fight, I'm rocked, I'm on my knees, and he throws a guillotine on me. And so I actually kind of laughed for a second in the fight. I'm like, oh, okay, this sucks. And so, uh, I didn't ever sit there and woe was me. I didn't sit there and go, well, this sucks. I got rocked. I'm in here. I'm half conscious. I'm kind of like not really knowing what's going on. But I could have spent the time sulking about the situation I was in. What did I do wrong to end up here? But I didn't. I just sat there and identified it like a math problem. I'm here. What do I got to do? Oh, his weight's off balance. Boom. Oh, he's stepping over. I'll, I'll step through. Oh, he's dropped his hips. I'm going to go ahead and windshield wipe and reverse step over the hips. Uh, jumped over. Oh, there's the Kimura. I'll grab it. Oh, I, I'm over off balance. I'll keep it behind his hip and I'll re-roll him all the way until I broke his arm. And so that's what I try to do with life itself. So that explains how I've pretty much conquered all my situations. I just, I use this called an UDA cycle, like observe, orientate, decide, and act. It's a Colonel Boyd, it's an Air Force fighting technique that they teach our, our pilots. It's a, it's a great combat principle. First, you observe something. So I was sitting there, okay, this is the problem. My leg is messed up and I'm having a hard time. Well, what can I do? You know, uh, what, what are the different options for me? Who can I read about that dealt with injuries from Bo Jackson to, you know, to anybody else, right? All right, okay, now I have all these factors in front of me. Let me make a decision of what I'm going to do and let me implement that decision and make an action on it, you know? And so, I consumed myself with productivity of what to do and not what was going on, what could happen if I don't do this, because all the things are out of my control. I tell people, hey, just focus on what you can control. I focused on how I could make my legs stronger again, and even while I was weak, what I could do to make sure I hide that weakness. How can I make sure that my opponents couldn't take advantage of what now is a weak aspect of my physique until I can bring it back up? So I tried to attack it from both ends, but I avoided the woe is me thoughts in bed and, and filled myself with with thoughts of what I could actually do. I know exactly what you mean there, because I've been there, I've went through a phase after I lost the fight and I had an injury, and every morning I was waking up in bed and I was crying to myself, I wasn't getting out of bed and doing nothing about it, and when I actually spoke to people, let them know what I was feeling, and it was a lot easier to get up out of bed in the morning, 100%. And, and I'm glad you did that. In fact, that's one of the things that really put you on my radar, was that statement you had, that men in our world don't really look to each other for help, which I think is weird because we're tribal animals. That's why there's certain codes of conduct that men have, because look, you know, you know, 5,000 years ago, if you lived in the woods and you didn't have your buddies with you, you didn't survive. That's why I tell people like the urge to have people like you is survival. Because if the tribe doesn't like you, you starve. Because we can't, you know, we're the most prolific long distance runners in the animal kingdom, right? But I need my brothers to co run with me. So there has to be trust, there has to be faith in each other, there has to be, you know, that's why you talk to your buddies and when somebody bangs someone's wife, you know, like that guy's out of the circle, like we don't trust you anymore, and no one likes you anymore. Well, why? Because well, we need to be a pack, we need to be together. So I don't understand where we had that divergence in the thought process where men were supposed to be these solitary Clint Eastwood types that just don't talk about their issues, because I'm very vocal and talk to my friends and I have them talk to me, like, hey, let's talk, are you having an issue with this? And sometimes I shock people because of the things that I'll say drives my wife nuts you know she's like why are you being so open about that I'm like well because I'm showing that I have these issues too you know what I mean like I have a hard time not fucking eating you know what I mean like and so maybe I can help him out and maybe he'll tell me something to help me out and if we don't share our ideas and our thoughts 
we're not of any use to each other and, and we're supposed to all be on the same pack. We're all the same tribe, you know? So that thought process, I think, uh, you know, I hate that people don't have it anymore, but I enjoy that you're already bringing a lot of attention to it because it's very important to me. Yeah, what, what you said there is perfect, to be honest, Frank. It's tribal. Like, we want to be in a pack. We want people to like us. And I think it just got lost in translation over the past 30 years or so and that men are supposed to be strong, macho men, but not everyone's like that. You know what I mean? And people need yeah. to speak. I said it to really my... Are. Look, Rambo doesn't... Ex- watching movies like Rambo, you know what I mean? Like, the good, the bad, the ugly. Like, hey, I'm a fan of those movies too. But they don't exist. If you look at the... Even our, our Warriors. You look at like some Delta team or SEAL Team 6 or whatever. You name it. You know what I mean? Like uh, uh, the, uh, the Royal Marines, you know? Like they work in a group. They work with a bunch of other brothers that they're constantly have each other's back. You know, there is no such thing as dropping one guy off in the woods and he's going to come get you doesn't exist yeah it doesn't you're right but obviously we talked about your injury and that coming back from that winning fight and then you beat the biggest star in the sport at the time as well didn't you when they, everyone was counting you out big brock yeah brock lesnar was uh it's funny because he is super tough fight because i mean look one of the base bases of our rest of mma is wrestling here's a guy who's probably one of the best heavyweight wrestlers ever to come out of college you know i think he was like 105 and three or 110 and three with some crazy record and I think his losses came to a guy named Stephen Neal, who's probably the best wrestler ever, heavyweight wrestler out of, out of college. And he just went into pro football instead. But, uh, yeah, and, and then to make it even worse, I wasn't getting credit for it. You know, I had people like, you know, Matt Hughes that came up to me backstage was like, hey, it's MMA versus pro wrestling. And I remember sitting there going, no, it's not. This isn't a pro wrestler. This guy's a legitimate killer. I mean, like, if you fail to see these a national champion wrestler, you know, like, no, man, get out of here. That'd be like me fighting Kurt Angle. And you're like, well, he's a pro wrestler. I'm like, yes, you're right. But you're not right. You know what I mean? Like, the guy's also an Olympian, gold medalist. You know what I mean? Like, if you gave Kurt Angle an opportunity to fight in MMA, he'd probably walk through a lot of guys very easily. You know what I mean? Like, he just, he just chose to go a different path. So that was very stressful for me because here I was fighting somebody who was legitimately a great fighter, you know, and, and all of a sudden people are saying, that, oh, he's some actor. I'm all, what? He's not an actor? What are you talking about? Yeah, he went into acting or he went into pro wrestling, but this guy's legitimate. You know, he's a real deal. You know, he, you know, high-level wrestler here. Come on, man. Who's not the most physically incapable human being I've ever seen on top of that. <laughs> yeah, he's one of the, uh, like, because as you say, you're a big man yourself, lad, but he's just next level, isn't he? Like, the size right. of him was just crazy. Yeah, his, uh, from the waist up. I think from the waist down, actually... <laughs> I got him beat uh, leg wise, you know what I mean? Like deadlifting and whatnot. But uh, <laughs> but his back was unreal. I remember even when he was weighing in, I was looking at him. I was like, Jesus, that's a human being. It looked like looking at a steer. You know what I mean? Like you look at a like a like a an, a, a horse and just like the the thickness of their muscles. It was just, I was like, I've never seen a human being look like that. Like it was just unreal. Yeah, I'll be honest. I've never seen him actually in person, so I can't uh, can't really comment that well. But. Just on the television, he looks like an absolute unit. No, television doesn't lie. In fact, it's even more impressive in person. <laughs> I got an up close look. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously, you mentioned the Nagera fight, and it, well, both fights because you've finished, you beat him twice. But uh, I can remember at the time I was I was a Nagera yeah. fan, so I I was I wasn't happy at the time, Frank. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I wasn't either. I was a Nagera fan too. <laughs> but yeah, then both of them fights. Yeah, fighting Nagera was phenomenal. Both of them fights are like two of your, some of your best performances and like they're like brilliant fights. Yeah, I was very proud to fight Nogueira, uh, you know, the first time. I really thought he was like, all right, you know, this is going to be a submission fight. And I was like, oh, here's an opportunity where I can really showcase my ground, my uh, stand-up skills. It's funny, it's kind of like there's a movie we have where um, uh, Tom Selleck, it's Quigley Down Under. And in the whole movie, he's this long-distance shooter, right? Phenomenal with his And at the beginning of the movie they try to offer him to shoot with a sidearm, like a handgun. And he's like, eh, it's not really my thing. So at the end of the movie, the bad guy puts him up there and, and they give him a, a, a handgun, you know, give him a peacemaker, you know, and they take away his long gun. Well, all of a sudden, you know, hey, spoiler alert, he, uh, he kills all three of them really fast. So he walks up and the guy's confused. He's like, well, I, you know, he goes, hey, just because I said I didn't like it doesn't mean I didn't know how to use it. And I felt that was really a showcase of that fight of my stand-up. Is that like, I've been doing stand-up longer even than I've been doing jiu-jitsu. It's just that for me, being a martial artist, submissions and grappling is what a street fight is all about in a duel you know if i have to protect myself you know i always tell people you line up a thousand guys i don't care if you get deontay wilder he's not gonna be a thousand for a thousand knocking them out you know um you line up a thousand guys in front of me or anybody who's at least a blue belt or higher in jiu-jitsu 
and you let me put a choke on you, it's a thousand for a thousand. It's never gonna miss. There's nobody in the world that if I lock up on, that they're not going to sleep, you know? So that's just my fighting style because that's what I believe in. My hands aren't wrapped in a street fight, so I really can't box you too badly or I'll, I'll bust my hands up. Uh, plus, civilly, cops show up, even if you're in the wrong, the other guy, they see his, you know, his nose ripped open and his eyes beat shut, you know, I'm probably going to jail. You know, so to me, strikes are just to get close enough to grab you. And once I grab you, you know, like I, I tell people, like, I, I'm very much, I watch nature. That's, you see how things are meant to run a lot of times in nature, whether we like it or not. That's, it, it's more uh, cohesive with what reality. And if you look in nature, all our grapplers, uh, they're the predators. You know what I mean? You look at, you know, everything from snakes, lions, tigers, bears, you know, even hawks. They're grapplers, you know what I mean? And they eat meat, you know, they go to kill stuff, you know, and they go for the throat. If you want to look at things that uh, strike, it's for mating purposes. It's the prey. You know what I mean? Like, they're the ones being eaten, you know? It's because it's not a way to go, you know? So if you want to be somebody who's truly dangerous, it's grappling. And so, uh, but in that fight with Noguera, I knew that he was expecting that, so I went ahead and uh, stuck to the striking range. And that's why, actually, the second fight working out the way it is, where I could showcase that my skill set and ground was still superior to his, uh, worked out perfectly. Is there a, have you got any like favorite fights or most memorable fights or anything like that? Because uh, I, I always like to ask that question when I have fighters on. Yeah, actually my second fight with Noguera. It's one of my most teachable moments. You know, here I get rocked. I'm almost out. You know, you know, Herb Dean, I think is about, you know, about a heartbeat away from stopping the fight. And then I get slapped into a guillotine. And not only do I turn it around, but I break his arm in about nine different places. So I, I turn around, you know, very much unquestionably. There was no, well, you eked out a decision. I'm like, no, uh, they had to stop the fight to keep me from, uh, you know, finishing his life. And so, um, you know, that is why it's so it's a, a great moment for me because it didn't start out well. Uh, and I think that's just life itself. A lot of times we don't start off well or we bump into a, a situation. It's not how the situation is going. It's how it's going to end, you know, that really we're going to be judged upon. And so... Um, you know, no one's going to watch a movie where the hero doesn't have any adversity. You know what I mean? We're not going to really be caring about a book that where the good guy never faces a problem. You know, like that's probably like we establish who he is. Then we establish the arc where he's, you know, all done and out, you know, and then how does he redeem himself? How does he come through? How does he overcome his adversity? And that second Noguera fight very much embodies that for me. Something I do need to ask you, yeah, because I've popped people's elbows and stuff in arm bars, but... I've never actually snapped someone's arm. What does that feel like? Just ripping someone's arm up the back and uh, feeling their elbow pop. <laughs> you know, it, it also, and I actually did a, 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 what's it called, a reel, trying to explain this to people that, that uh, I train actually for that. If we're rolling and I lock up a submission, I actually lock it up and I can now go as slowly as I possibly can, but I keep applying pressure. Because if I can go slow, and still apply pressure and you can't escape, that means I really own that position. And if you don't tap, to me, I just don't think I have it, so I keep applying pressure until, you know, hopefully uh, if it doesn't work, then I let go and we have a conversation on why your arm didn't break. Um, what was I doing wrong, you know? Um, and so, but if it does break, that's on you. <laughs> I give people plenty of time to tap. Um, but it teaches you not to look for the tap. I think too many guys I train with, they look for the tap. They pull someone's arm straight and like, tap, tap. It's almost like crying uncle. And I'm like, nah, your mindset's wrong. You're not thinking. That's not, you're not meant to tap somebody. What happens if you're in a street fight? You're going to pull the guy's arm straight and tell the guy, okay, tell me you're done. No, I'm going to shatter your arm and now I'm going to go to your neck. I'm going to put you to sleep so that I'm safe and you're incapacitated. Um, and so uh, uh, the actual feel of it happened. I tell everybody, it's like breaking a twig. It really is. Because bones have a certain amount of flexibility to them. So all of a sudden I'll apply pressure and it'll bend, it'll bow. And then it just gives way and it just completely releases and the bone goes all the way through. And usually, uh, well, so far I've never had anybody in a cage fight scream. The times I've done it in my personal life uh, in the streets, uh, I've had people scream, you know, badly. You know, usually they, they, they start hollering and, and uh, well, one guy passed out completely and lost consciousness. So. The guy that just like looks at his arm, just like looks at it and guy. Like yeah, no, that was a tough guy. Man. He's a crazy tough dude, but the way he just looks at it, it's just Yeah, weird. I think he was more like, ah, shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think he was more or less 
the competitor in him was just like, ah, shit. Yeah. I got caught. You know what I mean? Like, he was disappointed about losing. I don't think the, the reality of the situation had hit him, but it was a bad break afterwards. I was talking to some of the people around, you know, around him, that, you know, mutual friends. And they're like, oh, man, they have to put a, a halo, you know, some like needle through it because it broke in about nine different places on his humerus, the upper bone and the arm. And, uh, yeah, it pretty much almost ended his career. Yeah. Well, it's one of them, man, if you don't tap. That's what happens, isn't it? Just one of them things. Okay. But obviously... Yeah. It's funny, I'm not for that. I think if you don't tap, I really think you're... Now, look, if you go with somebody and, like, you know, I don't want to name names, but we all can probably think of a couple guys that, like, we've seen where, you know... Jake's tapping and they're still applying oh, pressure. Oh, yeah, Pilates, he's you know, a knobhead. The referee's trying to break your grip. Yeah, that's, that's an asshole move, you know what I mean? i got to be honest with you, you know what I mean? I've never, ever done that, you know? And and so I, I that, I don't get mad at the tapper. I'm mad at the person applying the submission. I'm like, all right, you're a dick, you know what I mean? But all my guys, like even in the Brock fight, if you watch when I knee bar him and he starts tapping, I didn't let go, but I didn't apply any more pressure. I just literally held the submission at that moment, and I'm looking for the referee like, yo, how come this fight's not over with? You know what I mean? Because I don't want to let go and, and they go, oh, he didn't tap. Maybe I'm misunderstanding what I'm feeling. You know what I mean? Because I'm feeling a tap on my ass and I'm like, all right, is that a tap? Is it not a tap? Why are we not stopping? What's going on here? He tapped like about 15 times, I swear to God. But I didn't use it as an opportunity to break his leg. That's not my goal. You know, uh, my goal is to apply pressure until if you do say stop, I'll stop. I won't stop, let go. So uh, I do think that some people can be assholes with the submission, but I think that uh, for the most part, I blame the person, you know, if, if someone's doing it slowly and you don't want to tap, that's on you. That's your ego. You can live with it when you're looking at your broken limb over the next eight weeks. Um, chokes, even I don't really tap the chokes in practice. I think it's kind of, you know, I'll fight to the last second, you know, and I probably get woken up at least once a month, you know. I'm like, oh, I didn't get out of that, did I? And like, no. And I'm like, damn it. <laughs> Good choke. I'm I'm the same though. To be honest, I always say if someone gets me in a Kimura arm bar, something like that, you tap because you don't want to be off the mat and not fighting for six months. But if it comes to a choke, we wake up thirty seconds later, tops normally ten seconds. So yeah. you might as well just go to sleep. Yeah, that's what I think. And it also uh, there's no damage from it. You know what I mean? You just it's like fainting. You stood up too fast. I don't think anybody's gonna sit there and think you get brain damage from that. You know that's uh, you know I think chokes. That's why I like. Them. That's why I'm such a fan of the choke. I think it's the ultimate martial arts move because it's so versatile. I can slap a choke on my brother because he's trying to drive a car and he's too drunk and I'm going to go ahead and put him out and, and take the keys from him and there's no damage. You know what I mean? Or I, I walk into my kid's bedroom and some guy broke through the window and he's attacking us and I know that if I don't win this fight, you know what I mean? Like, uh, what's going to happen to my children? Well, now I don't have to let the choke go. And I go ahead and, you know, I hold it for a little bit longer and now they're, you know... Uh, I'll send your file. I'm a family flowers. You know what I mean? Like you're bad for coming into my house. You know what I mean? But so now the same move can be a move of life and a move of death. Yeah. But well, obviously you had a, a career after the UFC. You fought outside the UFC. And uh, one, one fight I'm going to have to mention just because I personally think he's the greatest heavyweight of all time is you fought the, the GOAT lad, Fedor. What's it like fighting the last Emperor? Yeah. Oh, man, it was super exciting. I really wish I wouldn't have lost my cool in that fight because... We're starting off, and I, and I knew that his chin had, had been gone, and, and look, Bader proved that in their fight when he caught him with the, like the extended hook jab, you know, and knocked him down. So in the fight, though, I hit him with a jab, and he fell down, and I ran up, and then I kind of got mad in the fight because I had him pinned against the cage. I was about to throw a knee and, and finish the fight. And before that, though, the Bellator came up to us the week before and said, hey, uh, we're going by the new rules. If there's one hand on the ground, that's all it takes. If it's weight-bearing then you could throw to the head. And then when we get there, there's a piece of paper in my room saying, no, no, sorry, the commission's gonna have us go by the original rule, it's two hands you know, down or something like that, or whatever, so I'm still confused on what happened. Then I go in the locker room and Mike Beltran, the, the, our referee, comes in and goes, okay, I know they left the letter in your room and this and that, but we're actually going by this. So the rules had switched about three times uh, in the last week. So as I pin Fedor's head against the cage, if you watch the fight again, I have him with an underhook and I have a frame on his head and I want to throw this knee and I'm actually running through my head. Am I allowed to do this or not? Like, am I going to get DQ'd? Well, Fedor is one of the best heavyweights that ever lived. That amount of time that I hesitated because I was confused. He throws me with an Uchimata, right? 
Uh, and so it's one of my best throws and actually my ego actually for once kicked in. And so if you watch after that, as soon as I get back up to my feet, um, I'm throwing haymaker after haymaker. I'm not even being a martial artist anymore. I'm just purely just trying to, I turn into a street fighter. Uh, I was so angry. And then he, you know, a very sharp fighter, uh, took my head off for it. And so I'm disappointed in myself for losing control of my mind. So that's one of those moments in life that will actually be burned into my soul to be like, I lost control of my mind and handed the, the victory on a platter to where I made it to where somebody who was extremely skilled was able to take advantage of. Yeah, well, uh, what I want to ask is obviously I've, ne I've never fought for Bellator. What's like the difference between fighting in UFC and Bellator? Is it just exactly the same? Everything just... No, no. UFC is definitely the big leagues. You know what I mean? Like, they really are. You know, they, there's a reason why they're the lion's share of it. Bellator is much more mom and pop, you know, uh, and I like Scott Coker a lot. And, uh, more of a... It reminds me kind of the UFC was when I first got to the UFC in 2001. Which is weird, though, because Bellator has been around for a long time. They never transitioned beyond that. Um, so, yeah, no, Cobra's a good guy. I, I really like him. He's a very enjoyable person to talk to. But, yeah, much more close-knit uh, and smaller with the Bellator, where UFC is just, it's a machine. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's like, you know, it'd be like playing, you know, high school football versus uh, the NFL. So, what what would you think, I always ask people, like, I asked Tito this, what do you think's the biggest like what's changed the most in MMA like the way people view it or the skill level or something like that oh since you started fighting well honestly I think just doing better by the fighters that they get a larger share of what's being done and that's why actually my friend Harrison Rogers we started the Freedom Fight Nights um, and we have a fight our third one's coming up November 4th and uh Basically, he and I just he got together, we became friends, and he, he, we were actually in a pack together that he had started. And then he's such a fan of MMA, he had actually three amateur fights uh, throughout his career. And, uh, you know, but his wife made him quit that, and, you know, he went and became a self-made millionaire instead, which probably not the worst uh, <laughs> turn of events. But it was one of those discussions, like, you know, like, I see all these people want to complain about the UFC or complain about this. What what can we do? And so he actually had a lot of great business ideas that we're actually going to implement into American Made, which is the company that, that he founded and started. And I'm a vice president of that. I'm working with Sophia Magnata. Um, that we're going to put together, uh, you know, for example, you know, fighters are going to have a share in it. You know, like if you think about it, the UFC sold for 4.2 or 4.6 billion dollars. Nobody that established the UFC ever saw a dollar of that. You know, whereas with us, we're going to go into a, whereas, uh, the ability to trade. There'll be shares. There'll be a, you know, a publicly co a traded company. And the fighters will be able to get shares of it. And those shares will play dividends. So whether they fight for us three times or 30 times, they're going to see residual impact the rest of their life that they'll be able to get something out of. And the company sells, you know, 20 years from now for $4 billion dollars. Those guys are going to get one hell of a payday, uh, you know. So I think that also mimicking and following what other things are doing well, like UFC gives insurance to all their fighters from the day they, they, they sign for a fight until they, you know, we're going to, uh, you know, also take that. And then other little things, like the one thing that UFC and Bellator both do that I don't want our company ever to ever do is we're not going to use our contracts to hold people prisoner. If one of our fighters come up to us, barring our champions, and goes, hey, one just offered me, you know, you know, X amount of money to go fight, you know, in a month. And I'm like, oh, cool. We don't have anything on the docket for you for three months. Go. Uh, go fight. We don't want to have it to where guys can't make a living. Where some of those companies, look, I don't know if you've dealt with that personally yet, but if sometimes you tell them something they don't want to hear, then it's like, oh, well, we might not have a fight for you for a year. And it's a very much one-sided contract where if they don't give you a fight, you don't fight. And, you know, you're smart and you've done well with your life as far as I probably think fighting probably is very much second to you as far as your financial income. But most of these guys that are fighting, it's their primary source of income. You start telling these guys that have a wife and a kid or these ladies that, you know, they can't fight for a year or they take a fight and they better do this one. Um, you know, that's why you get people fight injured and hurt and, and whatnot because they, they don't want to piss off the boss, you know. And so that's one other thing that I want to change with our company. That sounds brilliant, to be honest. But what I did want to ask you is because obviously a lot of people went on about when I, my first contract came out that I got 10 and 10. Obviously, in 2001, what was, what was your first ever UFC contract? Two and two. Two and two. Wow, that's frightening. Yeah, I think I was actually probably overpaid to be honest. And you was getting overpaid? At the time. And that's the thing. Yeah, I thought at the time, like, they did me a favor. Because, I mean, really, fighters at the time, you know, like, I mean, our champions, I think, you know, were making, you know, like 90, you know. Um, you know, and they were the best fighter in the world, you know. And so, um, yeah, the, the problem is, is that there's two things that are happening right now. And, and this is, fighters need to hear this. You're not being paid because you're fighting Billy. And, I, and I'm dealing with a veteran right now that's like, well, I'm better than that guy. And, and that why am I not getting paid as much? I'm like, all right, well, hold on. This is how this works. This is exactly how this works. 
If I had an appearance and I put you on one side of the room and I put the other guy at the other side of the room and his line has 100 people in it and your line has two, I don't care who the better fighter is. Guess who's getting paid more? Because it comes down to who buys the tickets, who clicks on. You know, if somebody faces you in the future and they go, well, I'm a better fighter than Patty. I'm like, no one knows who you are, dude. It doesn't matter. It doesn't. I'm sorry. You know what I mean? Like, let it hurt your feelings all you want. Get better on Instagram. I don't know, man. Improve your brand. You know, when I, every time I fought Brock Lesnar, he made about three to four times what I made. And I never once shed a tear about it. I understood that he was the A-side that he was the reason people were watching. It wasn't because of me. You know, there was some hardcore fans that, that follow me, but for the most part, he has the lion's share of the viewership. So how can I expect to get paid more than him, even as a former champion? It doesn't matter. It matters who buys tickets and who goes on. Now that's for the fighters at home, for you guys. Now for why I think it's unfair for the promotions to not pay us is what they pay, is like, here's my example. When I fought Brock Lesnar at UFC 100, we sold more pay-per-view buys than Deontay Wilder and Tyson Fury sold. I didn't make a million dollars, right? Those guys both made that multiple times over, right? So like that's the part that I don't want to have part of our company, part of you know American Made Freedom Fight Nights. So United Fight League is never going to do that. You're never going to see us go home with 86% of the income coming to us and only giving 14% to the fighters to break up amongst themselves. To me, at the end of the day, the fighters are what people are watching. If I put a card on with you, it doesn't matter if I'm promoting it, Dana's promoting it, or Scott Coke is promoting it. If people are going to come watch Patty fight, they're watching because of you. Now, obviously, as a promotion, I can display it as well as possible to give you a great format, but like that's me just giving you the canvas. At the end of the day, the fighters are the artists. That's who people want to see. That's who people are here to watch. And so I don't understand why the promotion should ever take the lion's share. You know, you look at American football. There's a certain percentage that the football is allowed to take, and the rest has to go back to the players. I think it's like 42% goes to the players. And I think that makes sense. I don't understand why, you know, a promotion gets 90% of the income, whereas the guys were actually out there. The reason why people are buying tickets Dolan gets 10%. Just before we, we wrap it up, to be honest, Frank, at the end, I always have a Ask ask Paddy segment where people send me questions in to ask yourself. So I've got a few few little questions oh, here. So uh, first one, Sam Keeper asks, how do you feel about the damage control ruling in judging fights? Yeah, I think I understand what they're saying. Uh, look, I think there's... It, <laughs> It's not so intricate as who's causing more damage because I think it really, it makes it hard for grappling to get any credit. You know what I mean? Because yeah. like if I take you down, I pass your guard, I throw you in a head and arm and you break out of it and you throw an overhand right, obviously you caused more damage. So, it, but, but I'm still winning the fight in my opinion because of what I've done to try to finish the fight. It was close, much closer to a fight finishing move than your overhand right or your hard jab that hit me. So, but that's pretty much how MMA is right now, is that we very much favor the strikers. The yeah. rules are for the strikers. I mean, it's not any more apparent than the rule of, you and me are fighting right now. You take me down and I overhook your arms from guard and I start looking up at the referee. I'm the one stalling. I'm in an inferior position. You're on top of me. I don't want to be there. I want to be up on our feet, separated, right? But I'm holding you. The referee goes, hey, you got to work, you got to work. You can't do anything because I got my hands clasped, you know, with double overhooks. And now the referee stops the match, stands us back up, rewards the guy who was stalling in the first place and starts us in neutral. Well, if that's not showing your bias that it's all about striking is what they want, then I don't know what else I can do to explain that to you. And that's just because it's much more fan favorable. You have to be an educated fan to understand grappling and appreciate it, that aspect of MMA. You don't have to be you know anything about fighting. You're like, oh, that guy put his shin against that guy's face and he fell down. Cool, all right? So for the the uh, you know the non fans that are hardcore that don't understand what they're seeing, it's much more favorable to favor striking. And so that whole damage control rule, don't necessarily like it. Uh, but it is how it is, like with the Sean O'Malley, Peter Yan fight. And if you watch, I had Peter Yan before that fight. I thought Peter Yan was going to win. But according to the judging criteria of effective damage, Peter Yan lost the first round because 
there was quite a few straight lefts that landed on him that caused more damage. Now, he got takedowns, he established. I think how I look at a fight, he won the first round, but that's because I'm viewing it from the old mindset. But how the judges are supposed to judge the fight now, I think they got it right because that's just how the criteria works. I don't agree with the criteria. So I don't think we should be mad at the judges on this one. I think we need to be mad about the criteria of effective damage that only really leans towards striking. I'll be honest with you, Frank. I personally, when I watched it live, I thought that Jan had won the first two and O'Malley had won the third. But then I actually watched the first round back with a friend yesterday. And it was a lot closer than I thought it was at the time because obviously the takedowns yeah. and stuff, they don't oh, get... Well, if you told me if the, if the judges would have had to go the first round towards him, I wouldn't have argued. But I understand with the effect of damage. There were just too many times in that first round that oh, yeah, O'Malley pumped that jab and hit Jan with a straight and boom, I mean, he buckled his head back. Jan landed power shots back, but they weren't as devastating looking. So as a judge, you're looking, you and I swing on each other, I hit you, you take a step back and then you hit me and I'm looking up at the rafters for a second. They think you're winning the fight. That's just, that's how it works. They're like, oh, that guy's head really buckled back. And Peter was really much more hurt in that first round, at least apparently, than I think than, uh, than O'Malley was. So yeah, next question, Frank. What's one fight, you know, AJ Sanchez asks, I had to ask you first, I to say his name first. What's one fight you regret not getting and or taking? I've always taken every fight presented to me. Um, I don't know if I regret having missed any. Uh, I think that's why kind of a who's who of uh, the MMA world in my 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 uh, my verses or my on my ledger. Um, I've never said no. There was only one time. Actually, I take that back. I said no the first time that uh, they gave me the Roy Nelson fight, and that wasn't because of not wanting to fight Roy. It was because we had similar friends in the same circle, and I knew that he wouldn't care, and I'm going to get over it. But I knew that people around us that are mutual friends don't understand fighters. They just don't get it. You know, for example, to give you guys an idea how close our circles basically overlapped, one of my groomsmen in my wedding uh, was one of my uh, you know, best men, um, was actually his head cornerman when we fought each other. So like, <laughs> that's how much our circles overlapped. And so I didn't want to do that one, but then you know, I was told that I probably wouldn't fight in over a year if I didn't. So uh, I took it anyways. Nice. But, uh, next question. This is a crazy name, a, a weird name. Um, Mr. Russian German asks, asked for an update regarding the nerve damage that affected his right arm. His right arm was totally yeah. emaciated months ago, stemming from his neck disc issues. But couldn't you use your right arm at all? No, uh, barely. I, I couldn't even curl a towel for more than a few reps. In fact, uh, the day of the fight, I did everything left-handed, brushing my teeth, uh, uh, wiping, you know, everything was left-handed. Uh, I didn't have anything, no right hand anymore because of all the, I had no more cartilage in my, uh, my neck. So my neck was already starting to fuse uh, from uh, C4 to 5 was okay. 5 to 6 was demolished, completely done. And 6 to 7 was trashed, needed surgery. And so uh, when I went in, I just did all three levels. And, and immediately I got feeling back in my hand. Uh, building back the strength has taken a long time. Uh, I mean, when I first started back, I have actually a video of me curling my phone and my trainer literally is lifting my hand up to help me because I couldn't curl a phone. And then I would fight it as a negative going down. So it's gotten back a lot normal. Uh, now I don't think it's the first thing people notice when I walk into a room, um, but uh, it's been a long battle. It's, I mean, we're going on, uh, December will be a year. Uh, and they told me that when they did the surgery, they're like, look, you're not gonna be able to fight or compete at a high level for at least a year. And I'm like, yeah, it's me, guys, come on. Like, I, I defy the odds in every way. Nope, <laughs> it made me very mortal. <laughs> Here's another question about uh, uh, Matthew Robinson. What was it like recovering from the mo motorcycle incident and getting back in training? We, we, we spoke about this a little bit before, didn't we? Yeah. It was just tough. I tell people like, you know, you know, I'd have more bad days than good and it was just very discouraging. And, uh, you know, luckily I had a strong wife and a family unit around me that keep me moving forward. Because that's the thing, I, I don't want anybody ever to get confused. I mean, there was a lot of things I did on my own that, that take me to make that decision. But if I told you I did it on my own, I'd be lying to you. It'd be a disservice to those around me. It really was a team effort of people that loved me and, and really looked out for me and, you know, had a lot of patience because I wasn't the easiest person to get along with going through that point of my life. Um, you know, look, I was you know, heavily into pills. Uh, drinking was a, a way for me to, uh, to numb myself. And so uh, it, it was a very difficult time. And, uh, but luckily I had people around me that, that, that kept pushing forward and I didn't ultimately quit on myself. Yeah. 
Great. And I've got two more questions and they're quite opposites, to be honest. Anna A asks, do y'all have any advice for the younger fighters that want to be a future MMA fighter? I talk like 12 to 16 years of age. Yeah, just make sure you take care of your body. You know, a lot of people, we overlook our injuries. We try and take it as a medal of honor. The, you know, like, you know, like, oh, just, you know, just wrap it up and just, you know, take some ibuprofen and just get back in there, you know, be tough. And uh, trust me, I think most of the fights that I've not competed well at are not due to the fact that I didn't train well enough, but because of injuries. Things that just were just really, you know, detrimental towards my ability to perform. And so I tell people that, really make sure you take care of yourself. When something is injured, take it seriously, fix it. You know, do the best you can to rehab it. You know, don't take things lightly. You only have one body. And your ability to be a martial artist, you know, your mind can be as sharp as you want it to be, but your body's the conduit in which you perform those thoughts and those ideas. And so you need it to be healthy and strong. So take it seriously. Yeah, that's brilliant advice right there. I never used to take any injuries seriously when I was younger. Now I'm getting a bit older. Uh, I'm like, oh, what was you doing? Patty, I'm 43, man. You should see me get out of bed in the morning. If the house is on fire, I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> like, if it's before 10 o'clock, there ain't no saving. Call the fire department with a stretcher. Save me. Cause, like, or like, you know, like, you know, James Bond, sneak up on somebody. If I sneak up on you, you really have some problems. Because, I mean, you can hear me coming from a mile away. <laughs> and yeah, last question it's like an opposite to the last one it's a good one though Doug Norton asks hi Paddy as you and Frank are both BJJ black belts please could you answer this question I recently took up BJJ at the age of 40 and I'm loving it however I find it hard to remember all the specific details and certain moves and find myself forgetting what I'm doing it seems so complicated sometimes any advice for a newbie white belt you know don't overthink it um, really honestly like you understand where you start at you understand where the move needs to end at and how to apply it. So I, like even when I teach a move, let's say, you know, there's a thousand steps, but, you know, one through ten. You know, I make sure you understand one, make sure you understand ten, make sure you understand five. As you rep it, your mind starts making certain portions of the move second nature. It becomes part of your reptilian brain. It's kind of like walking. You don't have to think about it anymore, right? If all of a sudden the earth quakes, your body will step and adjust because it knows what the goal is of keeping your weight between your feet, right? So the more you rep out, the more you train, the more the move becomes less thought. And then as you go to improve the move, you start thinking about other aspects of it. And then that part you have to think about, but the more you rep it out the more that becomes second nature it becomes like blinking so don't try to make sure you understand something perfectly to begin with you're not and look we're always improving i'm always improving moves on my part they're always getting sharper so just understand the basics of it to get it done and rep it out to become second nature you know there's a story actually i tell people all the time where you know a guy's starving in the desert or he's dehydrated so i run up and give him a cup of water and before i give it to him oh the water is dirty so i run off come back and now the water is clean oh here's here's the water no 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 but it's not cold enough, so I run off. And by the time I come back with crystal clear water that's ice, the guy's dead. So don't ever take that approach towards fighting where you want to make sure the move is perfect before you apply it. Get it to where it's good enough, and then go drill it against somebody, and then drill it live, and then go. And then as it gets better, you'll improve upon the move. You're never going to understand it perfectly before the get-go. Great bit of advice there, but thank you for your time, Frank. And as always, I'd like to... Tell everyone know about your social medias, where to find you, and if you want to give anyone else a shout out, here you go. At the Frank Mir, on Instagram is where I'm the most active, but obviously I have Facebook and, uh, and Twitter, which I convey the thoughts to. I'm part of the FFN with Harrison Rogers and Sophia Magnana. We have a main event coming up uh, on November 4th. It'll be our third show. It's Augusto Mendez versus Javier Garcia. Uh, Mendez is uh, Sean O'Malley's jiu-jitsu coach, so you saw how well he did actually defending the ground. Um, we're going to go out there, and uh, he's uh, fighting out of the uh, MMA lab. So so uh, if you guys are interested, we'll be in the Mesa area of Phoenix, uh, November 4th. But uh, And then uh, I'll be able to put down tags later here where you guys can be able to watch it online. Great stuff. Once again, Frank, thank you very much for coming on. I appreciate your time. Uh, and I've had, another, oh, no, awesome I've had another MMA legend on my podcast. I'm smashing it. But yeah, as always, the fame. Thank you very much for watching. See you again next week.